So we just saw B cell receptor cross-linking resulting in phosphorylation of ITAMs. That is the first signal required for B cell activation. But you need a second signal required for B cell activation. And a lot of these are just checkpoints to make sure that the B cell really is binding a pathogen because it is possible that um, you know, the variable region of the light and heavy chain, we did try to screen out self-reactive T cells, but it's not, it's not easy to screen out every single self-reactive T cell. So one method that the uh, body has to really ensure that B cell activation is occurring against the pathogen is to have some more checks and balances in the system to know that, yep, the thing I'm binding really is a pathogen and the thing I'm binding really needs to be attacked. So not only do you require B cell activation via the um, B cell receptor, but there's another receptor that also needs to be activated in order for this B cell to really get permission to unleash an attack. And that involves something called the B cell co-receptor. So I'm going to introduce a new receptor to you now on the surface of B cells. So um, when we've been drawing B cells, we've only been drawing the B cell receptor on its surface. There are many other proteins on the surface of B cells, and we're going to learn a lot in this chapter. Here's a new introduction. Here's a new uh, B cell um, surface protein complex called the B cell co-receptor. So the B cell co-receptor, it's made of three proteins, proteins called CR2, CD19, and CD81. So these are three proteins that complex together on the surface of B cells, and they're called the B cell co-receptor. And every time I drew a B cell, these were on there. I just didn't draw them over and over because uh, we don't really see their function until right now. So this B cell wants to activate, so it needs permission also from the B cell co-receptor in order to activate. So I gotta tell you what the B cell receptor recognizes and binds. So if you look at the B cell co-receptor proteins, one of them, CR2, that sounds a lot like CR1, CR3, CR4, and it is in fact a complement receptor. So CR2 will see, bind some complement protein, and that's gonna help trigger B cell activation. So something else that you're going to find on the surface of B cells is complement receptor 1, CR1. Now, this sounds very familiar with innate immunity. We talked about macrophages uh, and other cells in the innate immune system that have complement receptors on their surface, using the complement receptors for phagocytosis. Here, the complement receptors are going to be used for activation. So let's see their role here. So this B cell has approached the pathogen its uh, antigen binding sites just happen to have a shape to bind some molecule on the surface of the pathogen. So we have B cell receptor crosslink. That's great, but we need more. So this B, this pathogen hopefully is also covered in complement, right? And you have to go back to innate immunity, uh, the alternative pathway, the lectin pathway, the classical pathway. Hopefully something else has recognized this pathogen in the innate immune response and complement has been fixed to this pathogen, but specifically C3Bs. This is, we're gonna need complement on a pathogen uh, in order to fully activate B cells. So if C3Bs are on the surface of this thing, it really is probably a pathogen, and that's what's gonna give permission of the, to the B cells to activate. So if C3B is on the surface of the pathogen, the protein CR1, complement receptor one, binds C3B, and we learned that before. We learned that in the previous chapter. Something else, something new is going to happen here, which actually uh, can happen in the previous examples, but we never went into detail because it wasn't important. Here it's going to be important. So when CR1 binds C3B, and this is the interaction between a B cell and a pathogen, what happens is this recruits factor I. What's factor I? Factor I is a protease. And if you recall, what factor I does is it cleaves C3B into IC3B. What's IC3B? It's a C3B that can't form a C3 convertase because we don't need any more C3 convertases. We don't, uh, we're fixating complement. That's great. Um, how's this helping? Well, another step, which we're going to introduce now, which was happening before, but we didn't really matter. Now it matters. Factor I can continue to cleave I, C3B, cut off another piece of C3, and now it forms a version of C3 called C3D. What's C3D? C3D is the um, ligand for the B cell co-receptor. So that 
complex of proteins, CR2, CD19, CD81, that complex of proteins, the B cell co-receptor, that binds C3D. Where'd C3D come from? It came from C3B being processed by factor I, which was recruited because of CR1. So, well, this is all great and good. Yes, it is. So now the B cell has gotten two signals that this thing that it's binding is probably a pathogen, right? The second signal that we just introduced is a signal from the B cell co-receptor. So uh, in the last video, we talked about a signal from the B cell receptor, phosphorylation of the ITAMs via activation of tyrosine kinases. That's the first signal that's required. The second signal that's required is activation and a signal from the B cell co-receptor. If both of these signals are received, the B cell will, will activate. If only one of these signals is received, well, that B cell really can't be sure that it's binding a pathogen or that its um, antigen binding site recognizes a pathogen. So a B cell needs both of these signals in order to activate. So that's the B cell co-receptor and its function in B cell activation.